Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, come to me, Nikael. Come to me, 12, 15, service. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. Everybody say rest for your souls. I want to talk to you today from the title in these next few minutes, 36 minutes and 36, 35, 34 seconds, from the title, An Arrested Mind. An Arrested Mind mind. Father, we thank you right now for the power of worship, the power that worship and praise is a weapon in the spirit realm. And God, we thank you that you would speak to us, God, powerfully, prophetically, and accurately exactly what you would have for us in this 1215 service. In Jesus' name, we all said together, we all said together, Amen. Listen, I'm going to teach you something today, so I need you to check in with me. I know some of you are fan and you got your Dr. King fan on, praise the Lord, and we got the funeral home fan. Come on. You grew up in church. That's what you got. We need to order some of those. We need to order some old school church fans. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all are like, yes, do that, Pastor. Do that. Do that. Praise the Lord. So just don't be stingy with the fan. We greater than me is our vision here. So fan your neighbor. Praise the Lord. Fan your neighbor. Fan your neighbor. I mean, if or no, it might be somebody you want to fan you. Hallelujah. Anyway. Okay. Praise him. An arrested mind. The Bible says that Jesus says if you come to him, one of the things he wants to bless you with is he wants to bless you with a rest. Rest for your souls. By way of review, in this series called Mind Games, we're, we're talking about the fact that although it's called Mind Games, that this battle and that you're in is not a game, it's war. That the enemy is after you. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And whether you're aware of the war or not, there's a war going on in your life. And spiritual warfare is real. And it takes place in the battlefield very often of your mind. That the thoughts and the, the activity and all the, the, every thought you think is not your own thought. And every thought you think is not from God. In fact, by way of review, there's four places thoughts come from. Number one, they can come from God. Number two, thoughts come from the enemy. Number three, they come from you. Number four, they come from others. But the issue is, Satan very often doesn't come and put a thought in your head and say, hey, it's Satan, I'm going to drop a thought on you real quick. No, he comes and he sounds like God. He sounds like you. And he sounds like other people who have voices in your life. And so you have to be careful because the enemy's at war in your mind based on your thoughts because that very often can make us weary and burdened fighting the war in our mind. But Jesus says, I want to give you rest in your soul. Our soul is our suke, the Greek word suke. It's where we get the word psyche. Our soul is our mind, our will, our, our drive, our determination, and our emotions. Our emotions. Some of you have been battling with self-discipline and can I do this and can I be consistent? Yes, you can because God wants to give you rest. You're weary, but he wants to give you rest. In fact, he said, I've given you not a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a self-discipline, sound mind. You can do this. You can control this thing. You have the power to win because why? He wants to bless you with the promise of rest for your mind, your will, and your emotions. Mind, will, and emotions. How does that work? How, what, what, what do you mean? How does he give me rest in my mind? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it'll be on the screens, gives us the way, because Jesus said in what? He said, to take my yoke upon you, come learn from me, which means to do it his way. That if I want rest from him, I have to do it his way. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 tells us how to get that rest. It tells us in 2 Corinthians, it'll be on the screen, for though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, listen, they have divine power. They have spiritual, supernatural power to demolish strongholds. We said strongholds were lies that we believe. And we demolish arguments and every pretension, everything that pretends to be God but is not, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And listen, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, which tells me that if I'm going to have a rest in my mind, I'm going to have to arrest the thoughts in my mind. I can never have rest in my mind until I first arrest the thoughts that come to my mind. I have to just turn that one off, please. I have to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. I have to take it 
captive, which captive is not a word that's passive. Captive is a word that's aggressive, that says, I'm going to apprehend, I'm going to arrest, I'm going to take it captive and make it obedient to Christ. What does that say? That says that you don't argue with the thoughts in your head. You don't allow the thoughts in your head. You arrest them. And until you arrest the thoughts that are not of God, you will never have the rest that God promises. In other words, you'll never have the peace of mind that is the mind of Christ until you learn how to arrest the pieces that attack your mind that rob you of your peace. But pastor, I didn't even know I was supposed to take captive my thoughts. Okay, you are, you're supposed to arrest them. That's the key to arrest. But for many of you, well, how do I arrest them? You arrest them because you have the authority to arrest them. You have the authority to arrest your thoughts. How? Because you have authority over the devil in Jesus' name. You have authority over the devil in Jesus' name. I want to teach you a concept today for the next few moments. Listen to me, and you have to tune in with me. This is a concept that the enemy will fight. He will fight you for it. He'll distract you. Stuff's going to go wrong like that, and stuff's going to happen because he's trying to distract you from this topic. It is called the authority of the believer. The authority of the believer, which means that if I'm a believer in Jesus, I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, then I have authority over the devil. That's a scary idea because some of us grew up in denominations in church where we didn't teach that. We weren't taught that. In fact, that was, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not sure, Pastor. Good, I'm going to show it to you in the scripture so you can leave here sure. But here's the deal. If I'm looking out right now, there's a, there's a police officer in our midst. I'm looking at him. If he goes out and he puts his hand up to your car today and says, stop. Does he have the physical power to stop your car? What would make you stop the car? His authority. But where did he get the authority? He got the authority because the state deputized him to enforce the laws of the land through himself. In the same way, you don't have authority in your own strength. You don't have authority in your own ability. You don't have authority in how long you've been saved. You don't have authority in how holy you live. You don't have authority in how loud you shout and if you can talk in tongues and you dance and you can shout, that's not where your authority comes from. Your authority comes from Jesus. It comes from the fact that I am in Christ and I'm seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the throne of God, which we said last week was a seat of intimacy. But I also must teach you it's a seat of authority. But you won't take authority if you don't believe in your intimacy. So my authority is based on where I sit with him and that when I go and I can go up to the devil and when the devil's attacking me in my mind or he's attacking me in my life, I don't have to just allow it. And here's why the enemy wants to fight you, 1215 service. Listen, because if he can get you aware of your authority, he'll lose his power over you. But as long as you're unaware of your authority or you don't know how to use it, then you'll allow things in your life that you use God to now help you get over rather than help you rebuke. Because my Bible says there are some mountains that I'm gonna to have to climb, but there's also some mountains that I rebuke. There's some things that I endure through and I praise in the difficulty, and there's some things that I take authority over and I bind on earth and they'll be bound in heaven, and I loose on earth and they'll be loosed in heaven. What are you talking about, Pastor Brian? I'm saying that you have been given authority as a believer. Once you get saved, you have authority that the devil can no longer just do whatever he wants to do in your life. So I now have been deputized by God the Father through the kingdom to enforce the laws of the kingdom on the earth. Well, Pastor, I don't have a uniform. Well, you, about, you, ha you do have a uniform. In the spirit realm, you have the armor of God, and I believe that you have a crimson, a blood-stained red uniform, and your badge doesn't say CMPD. It doesn't say Charlotte Mecklenburg County Sheriff. It says Christ follower the Messiah, the anointed one, in Jesus' name. And when you can step up to the devil in your life and when there are circumstances that come your way that don't line up with the Bible, you can say, in Jesus' name, I take authority over the work of the enemy in my life. And it has to cease. And even if it doesn't cease right away, the effects of it have to 
to cease. I don't know, pastor. That sounds a little too crazy. Okay, but listen, Luke 10, 19, Jesus says this. To the disciples, not just the 12 or the three, to the 72, which means it's for all of us. He says in Luke 10, 19, look on the screens, I've given you authority. Everybody say, I have authority. To trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome, everybody say, all, all. the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That doesn't mean nothing will try, not try to harm you or nothing will attack you. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard against it. It means, listen, that the enemy may try to attack, but you don't have to allow it. That you have been given authority. The devil has power, but so do you. But not only do you have power, you have authority. You have authority. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus in the Great Commission... We don't preach this part of the Great Commission, but it's in there. Mark chapter 16, verse 17, look on the screens. This is for all believers who have been saved. It says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, in the name of Jesus, they will drive out demons. Oh, that's scary, pastor. If you have authority to drive out demons in Jesus' name, wouldn't you have authority to take captive a thought that's from the, de from the devil? So if I can drive it out once it's taken possession, why can't I rebuke it and keep it from coming in? They'll speak with new tongues. They'll pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. When they place their hands on sick people, they will get well. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says this, And God raised us, us believers, up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, pastor, we're seated with Christ, but where is he seated? Ephesians chapter 1, listen, verse 19 says that God's incomparably great power was for us who believes. It's not for other people, it's for us. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, listen, and seated Christ at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Where is that at? That's far above, verse 21, all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God, verse 22, listen, placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So listen, let's make it simple. Let's play spiritual Mr. Potato Head. You remember Mr. Potato Head? He had the little, the little hair, he had the little potato body, he had the legs and the arms. Okay, cool. So the Bible teaches us that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, that Christ is the head, and we, the church, are his body. Christ is far above the devil. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is that significant? Because in the Roman times, the king would be on the throne, and the person who sat on the right hand of the king was the executor of the king's commands. He had the authority to kill, to, to say, nope, kill, live, die, do it, don't do it. He could sign with the king's signet. He had all the authority, which means if Christ is there, he has the authority. But here's the deal. If Christ's head is seated with the right hand of God, where's his body seated? Spiritual Mr. Potato Head, follow. If, come on, say it. If his head is here, where's the body? Who is the body? You are. And if he's placed all things under his feet and we are the body of Christ, then that must mean those are our feet and the devil, if he's under Christ's feet, but I am Christ's feet, then the devil's under my feet. Not because of who I am or my own strength or how well I live, but because of where I sit and that I'm seated with him. And what's crazy is we grew up in church, for many of us who may have even learned this, we kind of have this picture where we just live every day trying to hold the devil down because he's under our feet. And he's just trying to knock us off. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that he is far under our feet. Which means the way the enemy can get you is if you step down into his arena. But if I stay and keep my mind set on things above, his arena is the arena of reason. Where God's 
is an arena of faith. So the moment I begin to get in reason and play the mind games of the enemy, rather than take authority in faith over the devil spiritually, I begin to lose. What do you mean? Well, Colossians 3, chapter 1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I have authority. You have authority in Jesus' name. You have authority in Jesus' name. Do you know in the, in the natural realm there's a thing called citizen's arrest? That if you see a crime that you can, you see, you can actually, uh, I don't necessarily know if I suggest it these days, but you, you could do that. In the kingdom, you are all officers and you are all citizens of the kingdom. And there's some stuff you have to arrest. What stuff do I arrest, pastor? What do I take authority over? What do I even have authority over? You have authority, listen, over everything that Jesus died for. Everything that Jesus conquered, you have authority over. Well, what did he conquer? We know he conquered sin, right? So I have authority over that, which means temptation can't rule in your body. The temptation is just trying to, just trying to keep you bound. The weed, the pornography, the lying, the lust, the pride, the issues, the struggles in your marriage. You have authority over that in Jesus' name. But it's not just sin. That's where how many of us grew up. We just knew God forgave me my sins. He, he's, he have authority over the devil and temptation. No, but you have authority. Jesus didn't die for your, just for your sins. When he died for your sins, it cleared up your sickness, your poverty, and your spiritual death. What do you mean? Deuteronomy chapter 28 teaches us about the curse of the law. But 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 teaches us that Christ died on a tree on the cross and redeemed us from the curse of the law. So which means he overcame and conquered Deuteronomy 28 curse. The curse of the law, listen, was threefold. I'm teaching you, listen. It was number one, poverty. Number two, sickness. And number three, spiritual death. Which means that you have a right to take authority over lack in your life. When the bills come due and you don't have enough resource, when the car breaks and stuff happens and if this happens and you can't make it, you have authority, you, um, you get laid off, you don't have to just accept that. You have authority to know that devil, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna leave me hungry. No, because I have authority. So I take authority over this spirit of lack in my life. The spirit of poverty can't exist and I'm gonna be provided for by my father in Jesus' name. Does that, but, but pastor, I don't know about that. Does that mean that God wants us all to drive Maybox and Bentleys? No, it doesn't mean that. Now you may, amen, hallelujah. If that's you, let me get a ride. Be my Lyft, be my Uber, praise the Lord. I could use a ride to church, hey, hey, praise the Lord. But right now, I'm whipping the minivan. But the minivan that went broke this week and I had to put $2,400 in the minivan that's got 166,000 miles, of the, the, the mirror broke and all kind of stuff, that right there, the fact that God made a way for me to pay for it, yeah, that, that means that I may not have the Bentley right now, but guess what I do have? A minivan that's safe, that can put all my kids and I can get from where I need to go, when I need to get there, and he provided for me to pay for the repairs. The Bible promises everything I need for life and godliness. So I, I, I should be able to send my kids to camp if that's what they need for their education. Why? Because I can take authority over the enemy who's trying to rob me, steal from me, even financially. Sickness. You don't have to allow sickness to remain in your life. But pastor, I mean, what about cancer? Have you ever read Philippians? Do you understand Philippians chapter 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father and that he's above Ephesians 1, every title that can be given both now and in the age to come, which means somehow, let's be honest, the name cancer has risen above, risen above the name Christ. But I have a friend right now named Scott. I'm going to have to bring him here just so you can see him. But Scott was given 18 to 21 months to live with a rare form of one of the only 4% of the people in the world had his diagnosis of leukemia. But you know what? The, about two weeks ago, I was with Scott, and it marked 59 months since he's been alive. And he's had his best numbers yet. Why? Yeah, through medicine and yeah, because every good and perfect gift comes from above. But here's my point. Don't you ever let the devil make you think that sickness is above the name Jesus. God can remove cancer. He can heal diabetes. He can bring the dead back to life. He can give you peace in your mind. And listen to me. In fact, let me, let me give you scripture and then I'm going to tell you something God told me to pray for you really quickly in the service. Let me give you scripture. If we have authority over death, 
right? If death no longer reigns because of Christ and we live forever in heaven, what exactly is sickness? Sickness is just death in advance. If you're sick long enough, you'll die. So if I have authority over death, then wouldn't it make sense that I have authority over sickness in advance? And, and, and what's more is there was no sickness in the Bible until sin entered the world. And there was a, there's a teaching where Jesus heals a, a, a man who's sick and he says, go your way, your sins are forgiven. Which means it was the sin problem that created the sick problem. Some sickness comes from sin in your life. Some sickness comes from the fact that we live on an earth with a curse. And some sickness is just straight demonic attack on your body. Which means none of it's from God. And you have a right to be healed. And one of the things the Lord told me to tell you in this service, I haven't said this all day, I was in the back praying for you, just, just you. Listen to me. Is the enemy will try to attack the chemical balance in your brain. Because some of the mental games that are you being played with are beyond just your thoughts. It's that the enemy is messing with the chemical levels of cortisols and serotonins and stuff. And he's messing up your concoction to where you don't think clear and see clear and feel clear. And what you have to understand is you can take authority over that and you can believe that your body must line up according to the word, which means my mind must line up according to the word. You may not even know what I'm saying, but if you trust me, if you trust the God in me right now and you you believe that I'm talking scripture, here's what I need you to do. If that's you, you feel like, man, the, the chemicals and, and I'm on these meds and different stuff, I want you just to privately just touch your mind. In fact, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes so you don't feel, you don't feel ashamed. Just touch your mind if that's you. Touch your mind. Father, right now, we take authority of the, over the enemy in the name of Jesus and we command the chemicals in our mind to line up according to the word of God that our cortisol levels and our serotonin levels and our stress levels and the things that to balance us out that make the levels function the endo, the endorphins and the, the more, we literally God you be the doctor be the psychiatrist of our suke right now God touch our minds in the name of Jesus line the levels up use the medication to fill us back to full but let not the side effects affect us any longer and let it not mess up the concoction, but let us have the mind of Christ and every level be consistent to where it was intended to be in Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. Come on, do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that? You have authority over sickness, over disease, dis-ease, dis-ease. The attack of the enemy in your relationship that's trying to divide you, you have authority over that. Jesus died so that you could be reconciled to him and others. You have authority. Here's what you don't have authority over, others. You do have authority over people in your realm of dominion. So in my house, I have authority over the spiritual, the realms of my children because they don't yet have the knowledge of that. But I can't come to you and take authority over you if you have authority. Which means my, my prayer, I could lay hands and rebuke the devil off you, but if you choose the devil, I was counseling somebody a few weeks ago and I was on the phone with them, I was pleading with them to change their mind about a decision they were making and the Holy Spirit told me to stop talking. I said, Lord, no, that's giving up, that's the devil, that's a give up spirit. And the, the Lord said, no, you can't, cast out a demon that the person chooses to stay. Some of you, you actually have become so accustomed to this life of mental depression and mental this that you don't realize it, but the enemies made you begin to identify with it where you claim it and you actually, you don't realize you like it, but that's all you know how to function with. And the fear of getting rid of it and walking free is greater than the fear of managing it the way it is. I don't have authority over things, over people that don't, Jesus didn't give me that authority. Now there are people who are unaware, so I have unsaved loved ones that I can take authority over the enemy's work in their life because they don't have the knowledge yet. But when you become a, a, grown, a grown mature believer and you have the knowledge, then you are responsible to take authority in your life. Kingdom people, listen to me, those of you who kind of grew up with this or you know what I'm talking about, listen. Christ's authority in the earth will not be exercised if you don't exercise it. If the cops stop being cops, although the laws existed, 
the laws would not be policed. In the same way, God, Jesus, is no longer on the earth, which means he's left the work up to you and I, which means he's given us a commission to go get people saved, but in the Gospels, he didn't just get people saved, he got them healed, he got them delivered, and that wasn't the end goal. The end goal was to use that to get them saved. So we've tried to get people saved without using the other things, which is the full gospel, saved, healing, and deliverance. It's quiet, but this is new to some of you, and that's okay. It was new to me years ago too, and I grew up in church. But here's the deal. I don't have authority over others, but I do have authority over darkness in my realm, and I have authority over the things and the people who don't yet know their authority. I don't have the authority over the people. I have the authority over the spirit behind them. When Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, was he taking authority over Peter or was he taking authority over the enemy that was using Peter against him? Let me tell you something real quick. Um, part of having authority, though, is how well you're under God's authority. There's a scripture in the New Testament. Here's what I want you to do. You can't be here living a life of straight heathen and go out and start trying to rebuke the devil. Listen, listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Seriously, James chapter 4. James chapter 4 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Some of us are trying to resist the devil. He's not fleeing. In fact, he's attacking because we're not submitted to God. So the other day I was at the dog park with my dog. I had this dog, this chocolate lab named Kale. And you gotta pray for the dog park people because they need Jesus. Because some of their dogs, they be like hump other dogs and they get mad about it. And it's like always a fight at the dog park. And Kale likes to play rough and it's just like, yo. And then you get a little manly pride and you'd be like, yo, don't get pumped by that dog. And so then you basically like Michael Vick trying to fight your dog at the dog park. Just, okay, don't, don't worry about it. Anyway. Shout out to Mike. Uh, uh, he playing at AFFL right now, Flag Football League. But anyway, um, sorry. I went to the dog park, and my dog, K.O., will run off the leash. He's crazy. He don't listen. He's just all over the place. He had a bad trainer, Taylor. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, no, he's great. Uh, but there was this guy and these two German shepherds, and he was barking out these commands. Like, what? And so he has these two German shepherds that go to leave, and he doesn't even put them on a leash. He opens the gate, they walk out, he says, hush, 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 and the dogs just kneel. Like, what the heck? Then he tells one, Zantam, shumtum. And the dog just got up, the other one stayed right there, laid down, the other one ran, and he walked to the car, and he said, hum, 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 and he jumped in the car. <laughs> I think he literally was speaking German to the dogs, like to the German shepherds, I don't know. <laughs> then he called, he called the other one. He called the other one. The dog did the same thing. Earlier, K.O. was fighting with them dogs. Was. And I wasn't going to let him get punked. But then the German shepherd was so big, he tried to kind of get on K.O. And I was like, stop. That dog didn't listen to me. <laughs> because I wasn't his master. And I didn't know his commands. Could it be that you're trying to resist the devil, but you haven't first submitted yourself to the master and you don't know his commands, so when you resist him in Jesus, you can say Jesus' name all day, but he not fleeing because you're not living. In fact, there was a scripture in the New Testament where the Bible teaches that these dudes went up to rebuke a demon. And the demon talks back and says, um, who are you? Who you is? You know, somebody call your phone, you don't know who it is. You be like, who this? Not who is this, but you get a little gangster because you're trying to punk the person on the phone. Who this? Who this? You call me. No, you, come on, you ever had that art? Come on. The funniest thing is when I'll call people from the church. You're like, who this? I'll be like, it's Pastor Brian. Oh, oh, Pastor, Pastor. God. And the worst part is when they say, no, they're not here. May I speak to Steve? May I speak to Brother Steve? Steve, not home. Okay, well, you tell them Pastor Brian called. Pastor, Pastor, wait, 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 wait. I'm like, wait, I thought you just said he wasn't here. Oh, well, what had happened was, no, you just got caught lying. We thought you was the credit card company, so we ain't know. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what am I saying? Call ID. 
the master's calling. He don't, you don't know nobody's name. Praise the Lord. No, let me tell you something. Does the devil know your name? Because them demons say, Jesus we know. Paul we know. But you people, we all don't know you. Which means you ain't grown enough in the spirit. I watched a little YouTube video of, of uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. What's his name? That dude from the Bucks, uh, Giannis. The Greek freak, him. In basketball, Giannis. And they asked him on his, you, on his Instagram live, they said, is Mo Bamba, the new dude that got drafted from the Magic, is he better than you? And Giannis said, who? <laughs> he looked at this girl, he said, who? And she's like, he said, Mo who? She said, Mo Bamba. I can't do it because he cussed. But he said, Mo Bamba? He looked right in the camera. He said, oh, no. He said, oh, no. And he said, oh, he's a good player, but heck no. Heck no. Heck no. He's like, I don't know you. Who are you? I've been in the game a long time. Let me ask you a question. Does Satan know who you are in the spirit realm? Have you walked heavy enough? Have you walked with enough holiness? Do you pray enough? For, do you read enough? Do you, are you even, are you a heavyweight in the spirit? Or are you an amateur boxer? Which means some of you, the fact that the enemy's attacking you the way he is, is proof of who you are in the spirit realm. It is proof that you have authority. It is proof that you have an anointing, that the enemy is after you and he knows your name. I'm not afraid of him. I'm glad he keeps trying to attack me because it's a sign that the anointing of God is on me and all I have to do is take authority in Jesus' name. So pastor, you, 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 you okay. All right, you're excited. I'm ready to go. I got five minutes and 12 seconds to tell you what to take authority over in the thought realm. Listen, you have to take authority over satanic thoughts. I'm calling them satanic thoughts, not to scare you, but to make you aware. Because these thoughts are thoughts that we don't recognize from Satan because they don't seem demonic. For example, satanic thought number one is what many of you struggled with this week. And it's constant thoughts. Listen to me, constant. It's not even sinful bad stuff. It is the constant running of your mind. It is that your mind can't turn off. It can't rest because there's a to-do list that never stops running. And if you, this and this and this and this, and I scroll through and oh my God, it's so-and-so's birthday and I forgot to text them, I forgot to call them, I forgot to send an email. You got 25 unread emails that you got to clear out of your email and you got this and you got alerts on your phone and messages and you got the kids, they need this, they need that and this happened and it worked and this and I got to work late and then I can't go to sleep because I forgot about work and I got to send an email and I got to go home and cook, I got to clean, I got to do this, I got to do that, my day off, I got to do this. Her pastor got to hurry up because I got to do this. And we got the kids to take here. Single mother, you know this. Husband, you know this. Wife, you know this. Single person, you know this. And literally what the enemy's done is he sped our mind up to a place where it cannot rest. And what he's doing, because we don't recognize it, is he's trying to run your mind so much that he's trying to drain your mind. Because you, if you have a phone or a device that has apps on it, you know that if you want to conserve your battery, you have to close the apps that run in the background. Could it be that the subconscious thoughts that are running through your mind over and over and over and over are the thing that is draining your battery to where that little light comes on and says power reserve, low battery. And when your phone is in low battery mode, there are things your phone cannot do and compute. Could I suggest to you that the enemy's telling you you're mentally weak? But you're not mentally weak, you're mentally exhausted. And it's because your mind can't turn off. So when you go to bed, well, I sleep at night. You physically sleep, Crystal Withers, but your mind never rests. So your eyes are closed, but your mind is still running a mile a minute. The, I've read studies that say we have 4,000 conscious thoughts a day, but 40,000 unconscious thoughts a day, which means our subconscious is not stopping moving. And you know what it really takes? It really takes a spiritual trust. See, mental ascent and spiritual trust are different. I can mentally agree that God's going to take care of me. But real spiritual faith and belief is that, I, I, Lord, even on my, in, on my subconscious mind, I trust you to a point, and I'm going to raise my hand and tell you I'm not there yet. I'm there in some things, but other things, I'm not there. 
And you know what many of your dreams are? Many of your dreams are your subconscious thoughts trying to play themselves out because consciously you couldn't bear them out in your own awake state. I'm teaching you today. The enemy's attacking me in my sleep. Yes, he is. So you wake up not rested. And here's the deal. When you're mentally weary, you're emotionally charged. And your emotions are connected to your flesh, which means my flesh is going to win rather than my spirit rule. And what's more is when I'm mentally weak, I'm spiritually weak. Excuse me, when I'm mentally weary, I'm spiritually weak. Some of you, it's not that you're spiritually just, you don't know spirit stuff, it's that you don't even have the mental capacity right now to fight. You don't even have the mental energy to try to figure out, is this from the devil, is this from you? And that's why you don't make good decisions when you're tired. And you know what it really is? It's really a rooted in the enemy trying to get you in concern. And concern is the cousin to worry. And worry is not of God. And some of you, the Lord told me to tell you, your concern is about the clock. Single folks, it's about the clock. Your girl got married, but what about me? And I'm, I'm, I'm 38 right now, so if I get married now, will I be able to have kids? Because then how long would it be? And, and you literally are on the clock. Well, my kids, if they're not saved by this time, then it may not happen. And if the money doesn't come by this time, then it doesn't work. And you literally, your thoughts, your subconscious thoughts is about the clock. And you don't realize that that is not your realm. Because the Bible says, take my yoke, remember, which is his way upon you. But when you get in God's yoke, he determines the way, but he also determines the timing. He's the oxen that drives the pace that we pull the cart. Some of you, it's not even what you're thinking about, but it's that you haven't stopped thinking about it because you don't trust God's timing. And I don't have time to finish, so you're gonna have to write these down and we'll go. Listen, it's the constant thought. It just doesn't turn off. And then you scroll through everybody else's life. And now you don't just have your thoughts, you have their thoughts to think about. And then you go to bed with the phone in your hand with the thoughts on you. You know, studies show the blue light on your devices actually keeps your mind awake. Oh, I fall asleep better with the TV. No, you don't. You may fall asleep with the TV, but your mind doesn't turn off. God made your body to rest. Sleep is a place you get rest. He gives his beloved sleep. Hey, hey, dude, hey, provider, hey, husband, good guy that wants to provide for your family, that cares. I feel you, bro. Trust me. But the Bible says don't wear yourself out to get wealth. For he gives his beloved sleep. Which means it doesn't mean don't work hard. It doesn't mean don't sacrifice. But it doesn't mean sacrifice your family for a dollar. Because it'd be better for you to trust God with the extra dollars needed than to abdicate your role in the home. Single mom, God can provide more in the one job than he could in the three, if you trust him. Doesn't mean don't go work two, but it means if you wear yourself out with the three and you're no longer a good parent, but you're providing physically, but you're not providing spiritually because you're cussing the kids out because you're too exhausted, you have, played ment you have been mentally confused by the devil through concern. You know where a lot of our concern comes from? got to write this down. Number two, satanic thought. Number two, comparison. Write it down. Social media is like a mirror constantly into other people's lives. And what's crazy is we get concerned over the clock in our lives because we're always on somebody else's timeline. I can't be on your timeline. And she got married and look at her man and they out on a date and single and save, loving it, whatever. And what happens is you get out of your timeline because you're on somebody else's. And so you're in your single season, but you miss the power of your single season, which is the preparation for your marital season, because you're so busy trying to get married. Hey, dude, you're married now, which means you can't be following all your boys who are at the club. You don't do what single dudes do anymore. You come home at night, not calling her. Yes, you are. Comparison. Listen, when you compare, it only leads to despair. 
Some of you are in despair because you're constantly comparing. I'm this age, they're the same age as me. What should not be further than this? I don't have this. What career am I in? What am I really doing? Am I walking in purpose? Am I not? I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. Uh, I will, well, I'll go home today. We'll have today nearly a thousand people, probably over 800 people have come to our church today. I'll go home and I'll get on social media. I'll be feeling great about myself. Lord, God, you're with us and you're moving at Nikhail. And then I'll scroll through two, two scrolls. I guarantee you I'll find a church that started before us that's got like a thousand people coming. They had 902 and we had 882. And I'm just like, Oh. Why? Because the enemy wants to discourage you. Because comparison kills contentment. This week, my car's broke. I told you the devil was busy. He tried, so I got all the thoughts of cars and get them fixed. And this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And I, I didn't even have a vehicle to drive. So I had to go get a rental car to travel to preach on, to Fayetteville this week. So I rented a car and I found a deal. And they gave me a 2018 Chevy Impala. Less than 5,000 miles on it. Fully loaded. I got out that thing. And my phone started to beep. I'm like, oh my God, who's texting me? It said, your phone, it says your car has marked in your phone ahead of time where you are parked. So the car told me where I was parked? It synced that fast? The Nikeo truck can't even tell me what time it is. And it only got one headlight. Don't pull me over if you're an officer. It only got one headlight. It, and it don't charge your phone. So if your phone die, you in trouble, praise the Lord. It, the tire just messed up and blew up. It's all good. It turned off at the light the other day a couple times, but we touched it in Jesus' name. What, what am I saying? I didn't want to give the Impala back. And when I went to get in the minivan, then I just paid $2,400 to get fixed with the hole in the mirror and the leather tearing up, I thought about the new supple leather with the stitching in the Impala. And I thought about how at night there was this outside part around the wood grain that was the KO blue lighting. And when I saw it light up at night, I said, this must be God. <laughs> he speaks to me. God is light. <laughs> but you know what it did? Every time I had to walk back to my car, I forgot about how God just provided miraculously thousands of dollars that I did not have to pay for the repairs in my car to help, listen, to help me follow the plan that my wife and I have to ride these cars a little longer so we don't pick up a car payment so that we can get out of debt. So the comparison tried to speed my timeline up because then I spent four hours last week looking at new cars. Because you know what comparison leads to? Number three, listen, satanic thought. Number three, write it down. At least the compromise it'll get you to compromise and do what God didn't want you to do uh, and, and compromise is subtle you don't recognize the devil doesn't say hey go sleep with her he says what does she have on do you see those shorts are those, are those her butt cheeks how dare she and then the next thing you're like I can't believe she would wear that and then you even say that to your wife to justify why you still look it don't laugh because it's true. But pastor, don't you have like a Holy Spirit glaze over your glasses? Isn't it like a pastoral covering? No. It is called Holy Ghost help. Dudes, ladies, let me help you. You can't help but see it, but you can help by grace not to look again. You have to learn the power of the look away. My youth pastor taught me years and years ago. I remember being at a pool and, and girls in bikinis and he says, son, you, it's okay to see it. You can't help, you can't not see that. But you can't help not stare at it. Because the subtle thought says it's just one look. It's just one glance. It's not that bad. It's just one time. Nobody will really know. It's just online. It's not like you slept with her. You just flirted a little bit. You just, I mean, it's just a couple drinks. It's just one time. Like it didn't go bad the last time. You didn't get caught then. It's just for a season. And what the enemy does is he gets you to take one step in his direction. But one step, one small step to sin is a giant door to strongholds. You didn't go on your Instagram to see pornography. You went there to see the workout for the day. And then there was, in the related photos, stuff that the enemy said, what is that? You didn't wake up and say, I'm gonna steal from my job today.
But you did say, hey, if I log in and sleep in, no one will know. Because here's the goal of the enemy and I'm done. Satanic last thought number four. Listen, once he gets you to compromise, it leads to condemnation. And the enemy's job is to condemn you. It's to make you feel like you're less than, that you're not enough, that you're not a good Christian, that you didn't pray enough, that if you were really a good Christian, you wouldn't struggle with that. If you were really free, Pastor Brian laid hands on you, you went to the altar, you went home on Sunday night and you still did it. You still did that. If you, I mean, you guys fought on the way here. How can God do a miracle for you? You messed up. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. You're just no good. You're not worthy. You're just not a good mom. If you're really a good mom, you could do all these things at once because look at that other lady on Instagram she's got it all together and the girl on Pinterest I mean they have their little jars and you can't even keep the money and you did this and you did that and you did this it's condemnation but Romans 8 1 says that there is therefore now right now right now in this room there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus Jesus didn't come to condemn the world but to save the world through him John 3 17 so in other words no matter where you've been what you've done what you may mess up how much is left on the to-do list what didn't happen what you didn't do how much money you messed up that you swipe the credit card that you can rebuke the health issue but you ate the Krispy Kreme you can rebuke the devil off your money but you bought the shoes you can have all that, but condemnation says you're sucked. You know you're not any good. You're not, you should just give up. Don't even go up to that church. Don't worship. And conviction from the Holy Spirit says, you did that, but I love you. You did that, and that'll hurt you, so don't do it anymore. Hey, come back. Come to church. Let me help you with that. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest if you will by my spirit first begin to arrest the lies and the thoughts from Satan so that you can have rest for your souls by your close your eyes father we thank you right now God for an arrested mom God I'm crying out to you myself God that you would Take that constant running mind and God make it stop in Jesus' name. Some of you, the gift of the brilliant mind that you have, the enemy's trying to turn it, make it a curse against you. You can't figure it all out. You're going to have to faith it out. So spend less time thinking about the list and more time studying the scripture, more time seeking his face, more time worshiping the Lord, more time strengthening the spirit, not figuring it out. That's your word. That's your word. So God, give us rest in our mind. For the person right now who's been under constant comparison and, and just feels like they're not enough and the time is not gonna happen, Satan, shut up in Jesus' name. God, you, don't, you are the author of time. You operate outside of it. You can redeem the time. So can I prophesy to somebody today and tell you right now in this altar call that it's not too late for you? It's not too late for you. There is no age limit on destiny. And for some of you teenagers, listen, it's not too early for you. Some of you single people, it's not too early for you. I'm only 22. You can change the world. Jesus transformed the world at his early 30s. Dr. King was crucified by evil people. He was murdered. Before he even hit 40. What can you do if you stop buying the lie? Let me talk to the compromised. Listen. I know you think it's just a little sin and you're doing better than you were. I know you are, and I appreciate that. I told you last week, good job, well done, son. But you know what I'm telling you? That little sin that you're leaving is going to destroy you if you let it stay there long enough. There is no such thing as one roach. There is no such thing as baby sin. It'll grow, it'll hatch, and it'll take over your life. This morning, right now, in this moment, I want you to let it go. Close the door to compromise. Close it, close it. Delete the number, stop talking to them. Get out of the, DM, the, out of the DMs. Take the app off your phone, shut the door. Get a covenant partner with pornography. Get an issue, stop having the drinks. Well, it's only a couple drinks, but then it leads you to, drop, to do something else and to do that and to do that. Stop even going to the place, let go of the homeboys. Oh, but that's not loyal. What would they think? I'm trying to witness to them. You can't witness to them if you look like them. 
Darkness can't drive out darkness. It's not really dark. I'm better than before. No, light drives out darkness. And lastly, let me talk to the condemned people in the room because you know you're here. Because even right now, while I'm trying to pray for you, I'm trying to offer you this gift of salvation, this thing called Jesus who says, come to me. He didn't put a restriction on it. He said, hey, you, do with 17 issues and seven felonies and, and, a, and, a, and a drug charge and a weed issue and a pornography issue. You as a leader in the church, you as a gatekeeper with your shirt on who's struggling and you don't want anybody to know. Hey, you, ministry leader. Hey, you, singer. Hey, you, person in the back. Hey, you. Yeah, don't even, don't even try to pray. That won't work for you because you're not like those other people. Satan, shut up in Jesus' name. Right now, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus.